Savvy, so wonderful to have you here on the Soul Row Show. I was telling you before we started recording that I don't have a lot of men who make the cut. Nothing against men, obviously, of course. I mean, we love men here and we're not, I don't intentionally turn away men or anything like that. It's just, I don't get a lot of requests from men because my, my, it's such a feminine podcast, you know, the Soul Row Show. And we talk about a lot of feminine themed spirituality pieces to like soul evolution and ancient feminine wisdom. But as, as you know, and as you and I've talked about previously, there's something happening on the planet where the feminine is rising in men as well. I do want to get to your story, but can we just start there just to kind of preface where we're going and, and tell me a little bit about what you shared with me about how you have integrated your feminine, your divine feminine inside of you. Sure, sure. I guess the easiest way was brought up on another country in Argentina, which we tend to be extremely masculine, aggressive, you know, from a traditional background of an Italian family of immigrants that came to the country in the 1800s. And obviously, we were raised in a family that had traditional values and a Catholic background and a very strict upbringing with my father being an ex-military. So I was the man's man all my life. I was the class A but I always had something within me that it was different. I had an extreme sensitive awareness or heart that was conflicting with all my masculinity. And I didn't know what to do with it because I would feel extremes, emotions where my brother wouldn't. And I just never understood what was wrong with me and why was it I was so sensitive, right? That the words or the events that were in front of me would impact so deeply within me. And little did I understand that it was actually a superpower in a way. As much as this sensitivity used to work against me, eventually it came to play a crucial role as my spiritual journey awakened, right? And then my divine feminine came to play to the foreground to balance my divine masculine and be in harmony, which kind of freed me to have a complete different awareness of what reality is, what sexuality is, and honestly, to be able to relate to women much better and be able to understand them much better as a man and and try to empathize with them. The irony of all of this is that we all divine beings, if you want to call it that way, and uh, we are all asexual because basically we have had many other lives besides this one. At least I've been shown that. Uh, you can believe whatever you want. And in prior occasions, we have all experienced both the masculine and the feminine. And as you said, I think there's a change coming into the world where our consciousness, our divinity is coming to fruition to be exposed. So let's put it that way in this plane, in this reality. And that requires a new paradigm shift for society, given the way everything is. And within that paradigm shift, I think that men will be able to feel much more the energy of the divine feminine within themselves and everything that implies and use it as a superpower to be able to derive wisdom from it that is not achievable through uh, the divine masculine and vice versa. And that doesn't mean that one is less of a man or less masculine or not capable of aggression and fulfilling a man's role by no means. It's just that one becomes a rounder individual, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More of a harmonic balance, maybe. Correct. Who we Correct. Are. And yeah, I've often... It just, it, yeah. I have often reflected on how everyone is, is their own special balance of masculine and feminine. I don't know want to say it's like a percentage breakdown, but that's kind of how I see it in my limited mind, my 3D reality. Like we each have this very special combination of the yin and yang. And yeah. when we are harmonized, it's still our own unique. It's not like 50, 50, you know, to be in harmony. Would you agree with that? Yeah, like I say in my book, our journey is unique to oneself. So nobody can derive an absolute formula of what the truth is, because the truth is also subjective to each one's beliefs, right? And 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 appreciated uh, reality. But yeah, I do agree that it's not a one set point. I think that the balance for each individual is unique based on their circumstances and the life they sign up to to experience in this earth in this time. And there's nothing wrong with people that don't have it too. Let's just say that, you know, there, there's both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. And then again, this has nothing to do with sexuality. It has nothing to do with identification 
of your own sexuality. This has to do with how you handle the emotions, how empathetic you are, and how you're able to perceive others, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed with that. Being able to be in touch with that divine feminine has allowed me to actually be able to outperform my peers because I had always the ability to tap into resources within myself that other men have not awakened to yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I often think when I think about the masculine feminine harmonization, I think about giving and receiving. So there's a time to receive, there's a time to give, I kind of have my own like visual model that I created around that just because it's just, I think with a lot of men, I mean, I have three sons, I have three brothers, I have three grandsons, like I have all these three men's <laughs> and I've been married 29 years. And so I understand the battle that men face with, and boys, fate. my youngest son is almost 12. My oldest son is almost 28. And then I have a son that's turning 23, but I've seen this battle. You know, I've raised them to be, to listen to their intuition, to question things, to have empathy, to have a degree of emotional intelligence. And now they're, you know, my older two are kind of like out in the world working and they're like, <laughs> this isn't how, you know, this is a little, this is a little nuts out here. They're in that like place of just trying to see where they land with interaction with other humans that maybe don't, I don't know how to explain it. Do you feel what I'm trying to say? Like, like you give yeah. them this foundation and then they go out and they're like, wow, it's, it's kind of nuts out there. And they're trying to circumnavigate their own state of being and their own way of emoting. And it's been an interesting learning experience for them. It's funny you mentioned that. I think life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. I think I mentioned this already in a couple of prior podcasts I did this week and also in the book. And I realized that I stopped questioning why is this like this for me? And I started bracing it. And the divine always has a way to show you once you finally surrender to what it is that you sign up yourself to become in this life or to, to embody or, or do, right? And snippets of awareness do come through. I don't know the age of your children, but I'm already in my, in my early 50s and it has taken me over 20 years to be able to first try to integrate this within my consciousness, my awareness, right? And then eventually put it to use. And I realized that if you stop seeking, if you stop resisting, and you start accepting and you start surrendering, what's meant for you comes. And the awareness, obviously, if you do, I don't know, some sort of a spiritual practice, in my case, what has transcended me to be able to have Gnostic explorations of the divine and communion with the divine has always been following what I call a natural diet, which we can talk about later, yeah. and fasting and basically meditation, you know, and just being present, if you want to say that, between the hours of three in the morning and five in the morning, usually... That's when I had the biggest, most profound encounters and downloads, if you want to call it. And then it just kept on accentuating as I was releasing, surrendering, and accepting, right? Mm -hmm. Until the, the literally the metaphysical showed up in my life. Yeah, let's go into that because I think that three-step, what did you say? Surrendering, releasing, what was it, what was it again? Surrendering, releasing, and accepting. Accepting. I think those are the accepting. Yeah, it's just like, I don't know what was the case of you or, or your children, but in my case, I was programmed to be a conqueror, to be an emperor, to be the, the leader, to win, you know, right. to, to push hard. And that sort of work, that formula worked really well in my early career, in my late 20s. And that's when all started kind of unraveling, where all this paradigm shift commenced for me was in my early 30s when I had the biggest, probably first supernatural encounter that had me to draw a line on the sad. Okay, you're going to go this way in the world or you're going to go this way in the world. The choice is yours. What do you want to do in this lifetime? And I made a decision to actually embody light. And then from there, everything started unraveling. It has taken about 21 years for me to, to get to where I'm at. And only spirit knows where I'm going, right? But utmost lessons that I had to learn was, okay, I'm no longer an emperor. I'm no longer a conqueror. I'm no longer a leader. What am I? The process of accepting that you are not what you think you are. You are something else. And there may be other plans for you in this lifetime that if you surrender to them, meaning you stop trying to be the, the, the avatar that your ego calls you to be on all the program in society has led you to believe that who you need to be, right? And what you need to do and what you're meant to do and what's right and what's wrong or who, what, how does a winner look like, you know? 
and and you start surrendering to all those identifications. That's when you start creating the space for you mm-hmm. truly to embody who you're meant to be. It's acceptance, it's the surrendering, and and basically it's the creating the space for the divine to show up. It's basically quieting the mind and being able to overcome the fear of the unknown. That, as the, you're talking, I'm, I'm reminded of just like the whole process of deconditioning and deprogramming because our minds are so full of programs, conditions, yeah. patterns that we're literally just handed to us. It's like, here, believe this, do this. You know, like you were saying, there was a like track for success and there's a track for spirituality and there's a track, you know, for relationships. And at some point with this surrender, releasing, accepting, it's like identity death in a way. And if this I'm speaking from personal experience here, and this is still a process that I'm in very much. I feel like I, I went into the unknown and I sort of gestated there for a time, but coming part of that process was, are you willing to unlearn number one, who you think God is, who you think you are, who you think, what you think is going on here. <laughs> and it was really destabilizing. But it wasn't yeah. until I, like that last step you're talking about where I just allowed and accepted that there was a process happening that was bigger than me. And I'd always wanted a direct experience with the divine. Like I'd always craved it. I've always sought it out. But when it came right down to it, I had to completely let everything go that I thought it was and just sit with it. Just sit in the unknown for a while. Is that, And as I read your book, that's basically what I got out of the same thing that happened to you. There was like a dark night of the soul type of thing. I know that phrase gets used a lot now, but it's true. You, it's you true. go into yeah. the dark. Yep. Yeah. That's not yeah. what we were taught <laughs> to do. Nope. I agree with everything you stated. And I'm just going to add the word and. and. And basically an analogy is I always say that the cage of the soul needs to be proportional to the strength of the soul it contains. So the challenges, the unsurmountable hardships, the pain, the, the mm-hmm. stress, the fear, it's all commensurable to the strength of the spirit, right? That's within you. So being able to have the courage to completely realign yourself to a new identity by shedding your old identity and go against all conventional norms where you mm-hmm. come from and trying to convince yourself that, hey, this whole journey is unfolding as the greatest love story of all time, because it's the love story of learning to love yourself unconditionally. And when you learn to love yourself unconditionally and you surrender to your own higher self, which is divinity in a word, you start loving everybody unconditionally. And then I think there's a commonality in the journey in the sense that the stages may not be masked the same, but there's certain aspects or faces of the progress of the spiritual journey that are common to everybody, regardless of your status, places in life, sexuality, orientations, or whatever ideas or religion you may have. And I think that the process of identification is a common one for everybody. And the fear of letting go of what you've been taught since childhood, hey, this is how life should be lived. And this is who you are. And this is the things that you need to do. And having to break with all those paradigms, it takes a real courageous soul to, to confront itself and say, Something is not right here. This is not working. I'm meant for greater things than this. I'm meant for greatness. And something is missing within me. What is that piece that is missing that I keep trying to fill from things from the outside? And I think that's a commonality uh, for what I can tell in having interacted with other enlightened beings that have gone through their awakening or had similar or or to a degree similar experiences. It's true. It's true. First, it's happening. So if you're going through symptoms that you cannot explain or you start seeing things that do not understand, do not fear, you're not going crazy. You're being called for a very specific purpose in this earth and and just surrender to it. And I know it can be hard. I know it can be frightening. That's the reason why I came out of my spiritual closet with a scientific mind of engineering background for traditional values, somewhat of successful entrepreneur in corporate America, all of a sudden for me to come into the world and accepting this reality and sharing with the world, hey, I have visitations from the demonic and I have visitations from the divine. And every single time I've been through this journey, I have guidance 
and I had roadblocks that were unsurmountable because that was not the direction that I had signed up my life to go. And it was only when I started surrendering that magic started happening. And part of that magic is me now going back and sharing with everybody saying, hey, spirit is real. We'll get the divine God, whatever. I don't care what religion you follow. I don't care what creed. Those beliefs are yours. So I'm very sensitive to everybody's emotions and sensitivities towards religions. That's why I try not to make a discussion about religion. But I always give them a little fairy dust, like I call it, just something to spike their consciousness and their awareness and say, listen, every sacred text, I don't care what religion you follow, was some Gnostic encounter with the divine, that a prophet, a messiah, or a master, or whatever you want to call it, after wrote about it, or somebody wrote about what they had experienced. So for me, religion is the theory of men's or women's relationship with the divine. And Gnosticism, which is what I had experienced, is the application of it, right? Mm. Is the actual union of humanity and the divine and the manifestation of the divine through the human condition. Mm-hmm. And so it, with that, I, I want to touch on I know you said you have a Catholic background. I, I talked to a lot of, like I said, you're my 240th in, interview or 239th interview. So one one commonality that I have noticed with those who are seekers, teachers, feel called in some way to relieve suffering and and step into a role where they're helping others in some modality or way, shape or form is that had to transition out of a traditional religion or a spiritual belief system in order to do the real work that they're called to do. In my case, that was certainly a big piece and a a big, huge part of my undoing because of my multi-generational high control or high demand religion seven generations back. And one question I have for you that I have posed in different ways to different guests, myself included, is why do you think religious systems, and I would even say many spiritual communities, not just traditional religions, don't really actually celebrate or encourage direct Gnostic connection with the divine, even though they say they want that, what do you think is the fear or what do you think is like, cause you, cause you could keep following that all the way. What you said, like direct connection. You want to know, divine. You wanna know like, the truth. You want to know the truth. <laughs> like, like if you kept following that and you kept getting that direct connection over and over and over and over and over again, but you're in a religious system or you're in a spiritual community that's boxed with that or caps it this is my humble opinion so i hope i don't offend any of your sensitivities and if i do i please ask for your forgiveness and acceptance the same way that i give you the space and i accept you for your beliefs please accept my observations and my own experiences of direct intervention with the divine so take no offense i'm not for or against any religions with all those disclaimers i tell you what my reasoning has been Intermediaries don't like getting fired. Intermediaries don't like getting fired. Yeah. Most religious beliefs were somewhat imparted in the world, or at least the biggest religions, as a means to control humanity. In the case of the Catholic Church, which is where I came from. Okay, let's, let's just make a pause here and give some con- some a little bit of a background. So as you read in the book, I wanted to get to know Jesus, right? When the Spirit visited me yeah. when I was six. But I didn't have a clue what that meant. It was in the innocence of a child that I was requesting the creator of the universe to show me who Jesus really was. I wanted to know if this guy really existed and what he did, right? Little did I know that this whole procedure, processes that took place in my life would unravel and show me some of the footsteps that this divine sovereign being, master called Jesus, became the Christ. Now, I don't want to offend any Christians here, and and, and I know that every time I have these conversations with very religious groups, I tend to shy away from direct confrontation. I have my own opinions as to who Jesus really was based on what the divine has revealed to me, and I keep that to myself. But the truth is that what Jesus was saying was that everybody could attain the communion with the divine the way he did. 
where he was the only son of God in this earth that ever walked on earth, or where we all sons and daughters of the light, like I call it, or God, which is what has been shown to me, we are all capable of achieving the same level of communion with spirit that Jesus did. The question is, what practices did Jesus, who wasn't a scene, and I was a rebel within the Judaic, Judaic community at that time, did that were purposely left out of the scriptures for us not to follow? What subtle changes on the third century when they actually took care of all the Gnostic Gospels and say, this one don't belong here, this one's other ones we're going to keep in the Bible. The Roman Empire, led by the Catholic Church at the time and the formation of the Catholic Church, decided to change on purpose. We would not have access to our divine sovereignty, and we could be part of the Roman Empire that was in decadence. So I started asking myself all those questions, and then when I started doing some more historical research and read the Gnostic Gospels found in Egypt in the 1940s, and the direct translations from the Aramaic to, to English, it read slightly different than, you know, the King James Bible that I was, you know, force fed all my life. And I realized that there were more instances where Jesus was calling us to embrace our own divinity through the steps of the practices that he did, that what church or the, well, the, the church in general wanted us to believe. And that's when this whole exploration started. I said, well, if it was true 2,000 years ago, being a scientist, it has to be true this, this time around. And when I really embraced, you know, what the Gnostic gospel said, meaning I started following uh, a natural diet, I started fasting, I started meditating, contemplating, that's when, like, the big metaphysical breakthroughs started happening. And at this point, everybody may think I'm crazy or I'm making this up. There's really no way for me to verify this other than just, you know, take it for my word. I'm not looking for followers. I'm not looking for money. So what is here for me to gain? I am just embarrassment, right? That's the first point. <laughs> um, at this point, oh, this is the crazy guy. So the, I literally woke up three times in 2022 with a flashlight or a spotlight on my head that now I came to understand was the Holy Spirit in the way that was described in the Bible. And then sparkles of light in my room when this entity was speaking to me from a 360 degree omnidirectional voice and telling me things about my life that were going to take place or things that I needed to do and things that I needed to worry about. I've been shown that we all divine and I've been shown that we don't need religion in a way to communicate with our essence because the divine is within each one of us. In fact, the divine is within everything, but let's just say that at least it's easier to believe that it's within us. And the whole point of the book is for people and the readers to start questioning dogma and start asking the right questions. See, for me, it made no sense that an unconditionally loving God would only choose certain people for salvation if it did X, Y, and Z, and everybody else was doomed. Right. It never made sense. So right. that started right there and then showing me that my scientific mind, my, my first principles logic said, well, you, you cannot love somebody unconditionally and just do them to hell. Uh, you know, that makes no sense. And clearly, once these apparitions or, or or this sort of consciousness expansion journeys that I had had in communion with spirit, where I was shown answers to the questions, right, of who am I, what are we here for, who is God, why is God, right, Yeah. started being answered. Then I, I started reading the Bible, the, the old way that, that I used to read it, and everything had a different meaning. Yeah. Everything had a complete. You just like literally meaning. have new eyes, new ears. New, yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's and exactly now every... what he told us. Jesus told us yeah. we needed to do to be reborn, to have new eyes. Exactly. New ears. Yeah. Yeah. And now everything makes sense. If if you put it from that standpoint, I think it's primarily because they wanted to control us, whomever they were, for two thousand years, and the way to control us is to feed misinformation. And obviously, in my humble opinion. Um, it has been my empirical evidential testing within myself that if I eat our natural diet, which we can slowly enter into that if you want for a minute, our connection with divinity opens up, a natural connection to this entity, divine awareness, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter, it doesn't have a name. People ask me, oh, what is the name of God? <laughs> like, that's yeah, the language condition. part, just like the meaning gets warped when you try to describe it in language. Right, yeah. right. But but the, the truth is that it exists and it's there available for you. 
and your life can take a completely different turn for the better, obviously. At the beginning, it's going to be painful. I'm not going to kid you. When you start through this journey, it is painful rough. because, rough stuff. yeah, it's very rough because all of a sudden, just you don't know what size is up, down, left, or right. Everything yeah. is put upside down. And you question even if it's today is Monday or does the time exist? It's rough. Waking up is rough. But then you start finding your ground within the acceptance of everything. And it's almost like you're being carried now. It's like you're no longer in control of where your destiny is going. And you're being rewarded for the bravery of accepting the journey. That's so beautiful. Well, let's go into some of the disciplines that you refer to. The natural diet, the 3 to 5 a.m. Do you want to just touch on the diet piece a little bit? I know it's in your book. Sure, sure. I think I just as I was reading it, it reminded me a little bit of the Essene diet. I don't know yes, if you... Yes, it is the Essene diet. It is the okay, Essene diet. Good. But yeah, unfortunately, same. because of the corruption of the dairy industry and and the abuse of of all the chemicals that we eat, I, I choose not to eat animal products because primarily that's what spirit requested of me. That's when I left all animal products. That's when the acceleration of this expansion of awareness of consciousness started uh, ramping up. And I was very strict for about four or five years uh, from the started in 2018, uh, I would say that was the, the most profound of changes, both in my body, mind, and spirit. And every time now that I choose to eat anything made by mankind, I don't care what it is, primarily if it's cooked, if it's frozen, if it has some sort of a product made by man, a process, my level of awareness retreases. And it takes me about a good two weeks to clean up Wow! for the connection to, to reconnect and be mm-hmm. they call it the southeast state which is when i'm pretty 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 awakened so you've seen this connection between the frequency of whatever we feed ourselves with and the frequency of your ability to have that divine presence yeah. or that that sustained yeah. connection direct correlation one-to-one yeah it's i think that's probably one of the last pillars to fall for a lot of people because especially when you are in the unknown and the dark night and you're already diminished and you're already tired and fatigued and on all levels, mentally, physically, socially, spiritually, right? So sometimes in that gestating period where you're kind of resting into the unknown, you haven't maybe got to the acceptance piece quite yet. It's it's harder to follow these disciplines like early morning meditation and a natural diet. But what have you seen? Maybe you're noticing something it's, different. It's a, it, it's a narrow road, right? If it was like I say, I-95 here and you can just drive from Miami to New York, everybody would do it. The whole point is that it's not easy, but the reward is there. Mm-hmm. And when I tell you that reward exists and I'm coming out, like I'm saying to the world to tell you, hey, if you follow this practices that, by the way, they purposely left out of every single scripture... Uh, you will experience the communion with the divine. And uh, that's when, I, I, okay, like you said, I come from a Catholic background and during the mass, they have this sacred communion. And I'm sure that they have tons of meaningful relationships as to what it implies, what Jesus did, and everybody's entitled to their opinions. But for me, the, the sacred communion took a completely different turn when I experienced the communion. When the I actual actually communion, the, not the bread the in the mouth or the wafer, but the actual communion. Correct. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, so this is the symbolism that Jesus was saying about the sacred communion, being one awakened with the divine, being the Christ, the living Christ. Mm-hmm. And we all have that potentiality. Whomever tells you differently, they're lying to you. Okay. We are all entitled to experience Christ consciousness. It's not that I'm anything special. I always laugh. If you knew my background, if you knew my story, if you saw how imperfect I am, you realize that you can attain it easily, probably easier than me, because I'm already kind of pointing you, hey, it's that way. That's how we all feel. We all feel like (laughs) we're kind of the worst human. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But one, there's two things that made it into the New Testament before it was, you know, when it was canonized in that council 300 years ago that you were talking about with the Roman Empire. Um, And one thing Jesus said is, ye are gods, right? which is very deep. He yeah. also said that the kingdom of heaven is within. Does yes. it come by observation outside of you? It's inside of you. And I, I guess there's a third that, I, that I've looked at with new eyes, as you mentioned, in the New Testament. And that was that he said to his apostles, greater things than I have done or that you've seen me do, you will do or you can do. And he was speaking to yeah. all of us. 
And so there's a few little gems that, that, that made it into the Bible in the new Testament, but people have like, you know, apologize those away or explain them away because they just like that, that bifurcation of good and evil and hell and heaven. And, and, and that really doesn't leave a lot of room for people in their own growth process to actualize that way. I couldn't agree more with you. And then in addition to that, one thing that Jesus said that ties with everything, and then I'll, I'll sort of add, add a little bit of a highlight to what you mentioned is that it's not me doing it, but the father within me. And I have experienced that myself. I mean, I had it, as I mentioned in the book, a divine encounter through which I felt this energy leave my body and, and touch somebody in front of me and heal them. Um, and I knew I wasn't me doing it. I felt the presence of the divine and using me as a vessel. And I felt my chest almost about to burst and this energy leave my chest. Mm -hmm. And I just have, I was just up there for the show. So none of us are in control of anything other than surrendering, accepting and allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. And the sooner we all wake up to that realization, the sooner the divine manifests through us and within us, first to our own selves and then to the world. And believe me, I keep falling backwards more times than I care to admit. Uh, following the natural diet is not easy feat, especially when you're surrounded by family or you're traveling or you're uh, amidst, you know, your normal business life or work life. It's extremely hard because temptation is there everywhere, purposely to get us to disconnect and not be connected. And more so in this country, in the United States, where the food is highly processed uh, with a whole bunch of chemicals that are totally unnatural for the body. And tying back with the divine feminine and my own sensitivity, what has happened over the last, let's say, since 2018 till today, is that my body has become extremely more sensitive to these chemicals. I'm more sensitive to the wrong diet. The higher I, my awareness expands, the higher my communion with spirit, also the lower I go if I have a, the wrong food, and the more painful it becomes. So it gets to a point where you eventually say, you know what, this is like an old toy. I'm just going to throw it away. Clearly, it's not any longer for me, and it's not serving me anymore. I have learned these lessons. And you walk away from it, from it with the cognitive realization of unconditional love for yourself. You don't force yourself to do it. You know that if you do it, you're loving yourself because you're allowing yourself to become your true potential, to do highest potential. I don't believe there's any higher potential for a human being than to walk in communion with the divine which is right. our ultimate realization, right? In this lifetime right. or another lifetime. And some people really yeah. don't know that that's their greatest longing, their heart's greatest longing. Right. They don't have that awareness that that's right. what they're really seeking. Right. So they find right. alternate pseudo sources to plug in to get that connection when actually it's it's not real. I wouldn't call some people, I would say all of us. Yeah, yeah. okay, yes, all of us. We do it. No, no, that's that's a big number of people. That's about 8 billion of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But once you experience that love, and I love what you shared about it, like your, you know, you felt your chest expanding you for this love for this person. And it was just not you. It was just something that was moving through you, but yet it was you, you were a part of that. Correct. Um, when I think, I think part of the Gnostic text that I really appreciate is how feminine they are too. When they talk about mother and and they talk about, you know, Sophia and the mother of the universe and goddess in however way we want to define that. But I follow Mary Magdalene's path in the south of France, and I know she's a big part of the Gnostic texts. And so that's also been a big part of my own awakening is diving into the Gnostic Gospels and looking at Jesus's life from the, you know, that that mystery window of his 12th year that he was teaching in the temple into his ministry at age 32 or 33, we have this whole, you know, sp you know, this whole timeline where we have nothing on him, but yet we do. If you felt, if you, there, there's texts in India and all kinds anyway. So I'm with you. I know yeah. exactly what you're referring to. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's this beautiful, like we get to, design our own course based on where our heart is taking us and what we want and desire. When I said that not everybody even knows that they desire that some of us, it's like everything because, and this is where I credit my religious upbringing. Actually, my religious upbringing was all about finding God, finding being worthy. I know it was really twisted, but it was like worthy salvation, all of that. And it was just 
created this hunger for God, this hunger to understand it and to connect to it and to be worthy of it and all these things. And in my second half of life now at age 55, I'm, I'm manifesting the path of my heart, calling in what God is to me and recognizing and trying to integrate these things, right? Because I value freedom. I value liberation. I know there's a lot of captivity and I was in captivity. I didn't know that I was, but I was trying to push against this box, you know, and um, I didn't realize that I, that there was this whole multiverse out there that I was actually part of, and I didn't need to be worthy to be part of that. What are your thoughts on worthiness? Because I know we're talking about discipline uh -huh. and all these things, and that can, that can leave some people feeling a little bit less than maybe like, oh, I'm not doing it right, or, you know, I'm... Um, I don't know that I'm ready for that level of sacrifice yet. I know we're all in different places, but especially this worthiness piece, I think people get tripped up on that. It doesn't just come from religious programming. It comes from societal programming. Indeed, because an unworthy person um, is malleable and uh, can be convinced to do whatever is needed for them to become worthy. See, our worthiness is our divine sovereign right. Once you awaken to the reality of that, we are a piece of the divine, it's impossible to feel unworthy. Because like I always tell people when they come and ask me is, listen, if the creator of the universe created you, there's no doubt about that. And if you have any sort of, you know, belief system, uh, religious belief system, that I always try to find a common base, right, to get them from where they are to where like, they can start exploring these concepts by themselves. He loves you unconditionally. Who are you to question your own self, that you believe that the creator of the universe is wrong for you to be worthy, right? Because we were told that we're not worthy. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Now, I tell you, that's something that is not on the book, but I guess I have to because you put me in a position where my integrity doesn't allow me to say goodbye. Well, I won't tell you. Well, I tend to do that. <laughs> I know, but you didn't know, but this everything is always divine, right? So yeah. I got to go with it. So... During one of my journeys, one of my fasts, during seven years, I, I almost had like uh, a townhouse that I lived by myself. And, and as I was going through all this process, I guess, spirit or whatever was uh, making me have the, the life of a hermit or almost hermit, right? Although I was integrated to society, was working, but most of the work I was doing on my computer. So the reality is that most of the time I get to spend alone while eating a natural diet, fast and meditating, and that helped expand my awareness. Anyhow. In, and I would go through cycles, in and out, in and out, in and out. During one of the cycles of heightened awareness, I asked spirit, I said, why are you putting me through all of this? I already accepted at what point, right, am I going to stop suffering? Because what's the point of this, right? I sign up for all of this, I'm changing my whole life, and I keep suffering. What's, what's the deal? Where, where's the advantage of following this path, right? And it's funny because I did get downloads, I did get messages, but... I was still feeling extremely unworthy, extremely unworthy. And that's when I had one of the second time when I would call the divine showed up, not the spirit, but the divine on itself in the most beautiful vision. It was an amazing supernatural 3D bathing vision. And oddly enough, I was getting naked to get into my shower and the divine decided to open a portal in front of me. I don't know if it was physically or in my mind, I could not tell. But for me, it looked like I'm in my in the 3D reality and a portal opens up. Don't ask me how that works. I have no idea. I'm still trying to like make peace with the notion of that happening, right? Mm -hmm. And then I saw the most beautiful sky with the most beautiful clouds. And I saw this sort of star, golden star coming towards me with golden, golden rays. And I look at myself and I'm looking bathing in this golden light. And as it approaches me, I am going like, what is going on? Like I'm complete stuttle. And then I see gold threads come to me. And when those gold threads come to me, I come to the awareness that, hey, stop saying that you're not worthy. I came to be in front of you. So stop thinking that you're not worthy. And that's when I went like, when I went like that, it, then the, the vision closed. And basically that was when my road to self-worth started because I was suffering from a lot of lack of self-worth because of the upbringing I had and, and, and the way that life had treated me till that day. And then when that's when my sovereignty, my divine sovereignty started kicking in. I said, whoa, this is the second time that I have 
this kind of apparitions, you know, over the last, I think by then I was 40s, in my mid 40s. So something is happening here that I don't understand. But clearly, if this is happening, I'm probably worthy, right? Regardless of what I think of myself. And then, of course, there were more demonstrations and then realizations. And then obviously, once you, you connect and you have your real communion, one-on-one, -on -one, once you're ready, I guess what people call Christ consciousness, enlightenment, oneness, you realize that by design, we are worthy. And then also by design, we all feel unworthy. So it's a beautiful game of high and seek yeah. that we play in life. Yeah, I think moving into the acceptance that we're going to be bumping up against that constantly, that there are, are voices and forces that are trying to get us to feel like we're not enough all of the time, just mm -hmm. all of the time. Well, this has been beautiful. I, I want to get into, I'm, I'm just going to read this little part at the end, towards the end of your book, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about the dragonfly. You had this experience in your hotel in January of 2023. Oh, and one, yeah. yeah, and I'm just going to read this part of it. It says, as the dragonfly flew over me for a few minutes, my consciousness elevated to an unprecedented peak. In what felt like an eternity, I was experiencing unity with all of creation. It was as though the veil of reality had lifted and my amnesia was temporarily cured. I remembered who I was and my purpose on earth. I recognized that my core being was not human. My essence was a fragment of the divine. Consequently, everything around me wasn't indeed an extension of me. The entire kingdom was me. I had crossed the threshold of the kingdom of heaven on earth for the first time in this lifetime. And you write more there, but I just thought that was so beautiful. I, I experienced something very, very similar, which also included a dragonfly, which we can talk about. But yeah, anything, anything you want to say in reference to what I just shared, if you want to extrapolate on anything or any new awarenesses since then, since it was over a year ago, about this concept of oneness and the interconnectivity that we all have with creation. So the truth is that it's funny, people question the existence of God, but the reality is that the ones who do not exist is us. We are a compendium of all our identifications. When we incarnate, we are blank slate. And by design and commune accord in a co-created spirit, we agree to the lessons we come to experience in this lifetime. A sort of programming where a great percentage is predestined and another is left to free will. And when we free ourselves from all those identifications, those who are willing to do the work, those who are willing to surpass the challenges and go within and try to find the ultimate truth, you become naked. You let them go. And what's about to happen to you is all by a gift. It's a gift of grace. And in my case, I guess because I had done the work, my heart could handle it. My intellectual capacity could handle it. And because of my fervious, unrelentless desire to know the truth, and I kept asking, show me the truth. I want to know the ultimate truth. I want to know the ultimate truth. And I was being relentless, relentless for 20 years, seeking the ultimate truth. Because there was something within me that claimed for justice. There's something within me that never allowed me not to live on the truth. And I was tired of people lying to me. I was tired to being shown that what I thought it was real was not real. And I guess because of my unstoppable thirst for the truth, the divine said, well, okay, this guy's not going to stop. So I might as well just show him. That's my <laughs> my humble opinion, right? I was so persistent for that. And he tried candidly, or he tried candidly in many subtle ways to show me. But I was so just so like, okay, I'm not giving up until you show me. And the funny thing was that it was when I stopped seeking that it happened. So it was when I finally, I said, okay, whatever, I'm done. Okay, it, there's nothing else happening. I'm already grateful that all this sort of apparitions of things happen. And I think I'm just going to let it be. And see what 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 is to come from my life. And I follow one of the commandments that I received, which was be a choiceless observer and sit still, which is the hardest thing to do. I mean, that level of mastery is just the hardest, especially with all the programming that we have and all the things that they, they we've been taught since childhood. We've been taught and pre-programmed to be human doings, when in our core essence is the act of being. And in order to claim your sovereignty, you have to start being and that the act of being is the act of embodying something it's not the act of doing something so 
when you're doing something, you're an instrument, but you're not the doer, right? So whatever forces are in this earth, whatever you want to call them, they want us all snare in this preconditioning so they can control us. And that severs us away from our divine sovereignty, our divine rights. And when we go through this journey through our many lifetimes, we have a choice to be able to free ourselves from it. And when we do, we commune with our higher self. Our higher self is the divine spirit. And we, we get the chance to experience that. Now, is that a state of awareness that we're going to probably remain there? I don't know. Have I experienced it again since that day? No. But I can tell you it has been so profound that has shaken the core essence of my identity, the core essence of my whole life. And I started transitioning, both physically, spiritually, and emotionally into a new being. What that being will be, I don't know, because I realized that the more I surrender to what the outcome will be, the more I actually align myself with the divine template that is for this lifetime, for this avatar called Savvy. And all I have to do is just keep surrendering, keep accepting, and keep trusting that it will unfold in perfect time, shape, and form. Now, is that easy? Hell no. It takes a lot of courage to do it. But once you've shown that you're not going crazy, that the divine actually resides within you, you will be actually crazy, you know, not doing it and going back into the cage that you were brought out of, right? The message I have for everybody is that what I experience, everybody can experience. Uh, you just have to go through the Gnostic path and ask for the truth to be shown to you. I guess that's next. Love that you were so unrelenting, you know, just, I'm going to, this is going to happen. Like, but then you just let go. And that was the moment of magic. That was it. Yeah. That's one of the key learnings in this whole journey is that it's never up to us. It's yeah. never up to us. Once we think, surrender, it happens. Yeah. And I think the natural world shows up in support of that. Hence the dragonfly. Yes. Uh, do you oh, yeah. We forgot share the what that means. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you want to share what the dragonfly yeah. means for you and how? So, so, so this whole journey, right? One questions its sanity and it, it's been a common denominator that I ask, say, listen, I'll do whatever. I'll just walk over for water, fire, whatever. But please show me I'm not going crazy. So the way that that the divine started showing me that I'm not going crazy was the spontaneous channeling of people in front of me, random people where the spirit would enter them and the person would start like crying out of their lungs and telling me, God is telling me to tell you certain things, right? So you can imagine how shocking it is for you go to the gym and all of a sudden some dude in front of you you never met is channeling for you and the emotions that this person is going through and the emotions you're going through, right? Or, or maybe you go on a date and all of a sudden that date calls you three months later and says, God told me to tell you this thing, please come to church, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, a lot of events of that nature. And then you go to the building and you have a lady there that starts channeling this spirit right in front of you and telling you things that even your mother knows right about you. So I ask, listen, so good. I think I'm going crazy. I need to know if I need to go to an asylum or you can send <laughs> something for me to make sure that I'm not going crazy, that everybody can see. Because if I see it alone, it's not going to be sufficient for my rational mind. So I don't know why I chose the dragonfly at the time, but... Then after doing some research, the dragonfly has a lot of meaning, right, in the spiritual realms, and it's a spiritual animal. So in the last two divine encounters where the spirit used me as a vessel to do something, to manifest something, he called my attention first to a dragonfly. I think it was 280 days ago, the last manifestation I had when I was on a trip in Greece with my current girlfriend. And during those two weeks that I was eating a highly natural, unprocessed, unpolluted diet, in the Ionian Islands in Greece, where the food is amazing, I was able to attain a higher state of consciousness uh, throughout my daily routine of, of meditation and, and just eating super clean. And the dragonfly showed up in both events just to warn me, say, hey, you're not going crazy. You know, you're being called up to the stage. So just mm. relax and cooperate here. And during the one that you just read, uh, as I was experiencing this oneness, we were in a catamaran between two islands in the middle of the Ionian Ocean. So there was no 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 possibility that a dragonfly was going to be in the catamaran. And out of nowhere, from within the catamaran, a dragonfly showed up and circled around me while the event was taking place. And my girlfriend was looking at it while she knew I was in a trance and I was just like static. And then when the spirit left me, the dragonfly left with the spirit. 
So that's the reason of the dragonfly in my book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I had an experience in Costa Rica, a very transcendental experience. And towards the end of my journey, which I believe a part of me died, there was definitely an identity death. And I know a lot of times dragonflies can represent, you know, transitioning to the spirit world or a message from spirit, as you mentioned, it's different for everyone. But my new friend that I had made there witnessed it. I, I didn't realize that I had dragonflies circling me, but she did. Beautiful. And beautiful. so there were just a lot of really beautiful synchronicities, just getting out of my normal environment, going to another country, surrendering, opening myself to be taught. It was, let's be, I will be forthright about this. It was an ayahuasca journey four four nights in a row after when this happened. And I know you, you have experimented with plant medicine and you speak about it in your book. And I think we're coming into an age where these plants are showing us not only expanded stage of consciousness, but also just like who we are in relation to the unity, you know, the unified field or unity consciousness or the one. And it was one of the most radical risk, risk taking ventures of my life. I went there alone, but I was definitely supported and held and it was very sacred and I'm still integrating it. Mine was, that was in 2021. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted you to speak to the direct like, as I know it's on the cover of your book now. And, you know, that was part of how sometimes we need something tangible rather than just the ethereal, right? We need, or I guess the divine, however that works, will send or usher in animals or plants or the sun or something just to show us that we are part of something higher, that there is a bigger plan at play, that we're part of this web of life and that we're not alone. And I think that's, for me, I just wanted to know that I was on the right path, whatever right means, and that I was entirely deeply known and seen. And, and I think that's important for all of us to be witnessed in whatever's happening and whatever's going on. And um, I love that you wrote this book because I think it will be very affirming um, for a lot of people who are just on that precipice of, hey, who am I? And do I have the courage to step into this new identity or whatever, like keep shedding your identity? Really, it's not about stepping into a new identity. It's about remembering who you are and shedding the old identities and letting that just kind of shine through. Don't, don't you think that's kind of why we're here is to just let the God in us shine through? I could not have said it better. The only thing I could add is I see you, I feel you, I am you. Yeah. And you are me and I see you and me and we are all one, right? Yes. That's the most perfect way I can think of <laughs> to end this beautiful discussion. Savi, thank you for your time. My pleasure. My pleasure. And for and your again, gifts and for who you are. Yeah, that, that I will put the links in the description of the video for the book. The yes. book is available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. Do you want to discount. share the title for us again? Yes, The Journey Begins Within, which is in the background here by Savi. Most spiritual books are at a much higher price point. I try to do this for the benefit of humanity. So I'm just basically covering the costs and all the proceeds, whatever's left, goes to the foundation I created, which is a ministry with a sole intention to spread this word throughout the world and help others awaken to the reality of who they truly are. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure.